Greetings, ladies and mantle gents, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales of the Space. Space. And as always, I hope that you enjoy. Story number one. A routine weapons inspection written by Fox Corp. Life as a weapons inspector is difficult. From the countless deaths under strange circumstances, political pressure, bribes, and death threats, it is no surprise that of all the jobs in the galaxy, being an inspector is among the highest paying and most dangerous. Yet, to Ragnar Thronton, it was the most enthralling occupation available. For 200 years, he has been a weapons inspector for the Galactic Compact. Not only does he enjoy the work, but also has connections it brings him. Throughout his career, he has diligently watched the many species of the galaxy and ensured compliance with the law. Today, the old inspector would be visiting a species whose name is infamous amongst the weapons inspectors across the galaxy. The humans. These humans were not infamous for all suspect deaths, bribery, corruption, or danger, but the incredible ability to create incomprehensibly potent superweapons not covered by galactic law. Every year, their scientists and engineers come up with mind-bogglingly insane blueprints and prototypes for weapons that could annihilate entire star clusters. Ragnar was ready for a very long day. As he got out of bed, he stretched his arms, walked to his bathroom, took a shower, cleaned his mandibles, and put on his ceremonious clothes. His species, the Retikar, had very similar physiology to humans. Due to this, it was more often than not his duty to inspect human shipyards and battle fleets. Today, however, he expected no conflict. He was to inspect the shipyards of the Terran government in orbit around Earth. This one shipyard produced more galactic laws than most governments ever would. With every inspection, a new superweapon would be found nestled in a loophole more complicated than the last. Ragnar took one last inventory of his belongings, then exited his hotel room, took an elevator to the lobby, exited the building, and entered a black car waiting for him outside. The car took him to Cape Canaveral Space Elevator, where he boarded Elevator 1A, and began his ten-minute journey to space. From there, the shuttle took him directly to the massive station where his day's work lay. Welcome back, Ragnar. Always nice to see you, though I'm afraid your visit will be unnecessary, said the Fleet Admiral Green with the smirk. The station no longer manufactures any weapons. Oh, come on, Green. For 120 years I've known you. You've never stopped making guns. Take me to the testing grounds. We don't make weapons anymore, so there is no testing grounds. But we do have restaurants, and, uh, we do make a mean burger. Maybe after you show me whatever it is you are making, replied Ragnar with a smile. After all, if they aren't weapons, you don't mind me taking a look? Certainly. Follow me. The Admiral turned and began to walk down the large corridor to the testing room. If I may ask, Admiral, what exactly are you making here? Green hesitated for a moment obviously trying to remember the exact terminology used by his engineers before replying. Singularity waste heat disposers. As of last week, all human ships now operate on the Kugel Blitz energy generators. Singularity? As in black hole? Yes, uh, but artificially, co completely harmless, so long as you don't touch it. Green began to chuckle at his statement, seemingly amusing himself with his clear disregard for safety. I do not find that funny. Touching a black hole would result in a horribly painful death. The Admiral didn't seem to care about Ragnar, pointing out the inherent danger, only chuckling harder, before refinely regaining composure. The two walked in silence for multiple minutes before finally reaching a large blast door. The Admiral placed his hand on the scanner, to which the door began to whine and open. After you, Green said. As Ragnar walked through the door, he was struck by the absolute size of the complex. It was well over ten miles long and four miles wide. All throughout the complex, engineers worked on massive devices that looked similar to the magnetic accelerators common on human ships. I thought you weren't making weapons anymore. We aren't. Those are a, uh, a singularity waste heat disposers, as I told you earlier. Why do they look like your spinal-bound weapons, then? 
because we need them to get the heat out of the Singularity Containment Field quickly. How quickly? About 99% of the speed of light. These babies heat up quickly, and we can't have that. What? 99% yes. How is that not a weapon? Because it isn't designed as one. How destructive is it? I'll show you. Hey, Jenkins, get a test ready, and lower the radiation shielding. A man on the control platform gave the Admiral a thumbs up and pressed a couple buttons on his station. All personnel leave work floor, or live testing commencing soon. The thousands of workers along the floor began to run away from the area, each one entering a separate compartment shielded by a meter of lead. A massive blast storm began to close from in front of Ragnar and Green, and the two of them were handed protective goggles by a young scientist. After 30 seconds, the blast door fully closed, and the two of them moved to a small viewing port in the door. Jenkins, drop the, uh, heat absorber, then start it up. Yes, sir. Morning lights began to flash as a standard military cruiser was lowered in front of the heat disposer. Once it was fully lowered, the Admiral got giddy, a look of anticipation on his face, before yelling, Do it! An absurdly bright beam of energy shot out of the magnetic accelerator. It smashed into the fully operational shield of the cruiser. Within a fraction of a second, the shield shattered, and the beam continued on its journey. It ripped through the armor plating of the cruiser. A horrific screeching noise was heard, and within half a second, the beam pierced straight through the other side of the cruiser. It smashed into the shield protecting the rest of the station, and it began to flicker. Shut it down, screamed the Admiral before the beam began to weaken and eventually dissipate. Ragnar was horrified. Green, what the hell was that? A heat disposer. It just gutted a military cruiser from bow to stern, then went out the other side and just about destroyed the whole station, all in less than a second. Did it? Yes. I uh, must have blinked, Green yawned. Anyways... We've already outfitted all of our ships with this revolutionary new energy device. I'll make sure to tell you our boys in uniform to be careful of the exhaust port. You what? End of story. Story number two. Demons Walk Beside Them. Written by Dragonson04. The human homeworld was just as harsh as ours. So it was not a threat to us as it would be to others in the galaxy. Death worlders were few and far between, and those of us who evolved in such worlds and managed to actually take to the stars were even rarer. We, the Zalea, and the humans, and the Annex were the only human death world species to actually leave our home planet. The humans themselves were no stronger or faster or tougher than we were. In spite of our nearly opposite natures, with them being mammals and us being reptiles, we were nearly perfectly evenly matched in all fields. Not only their tolerance for cold surpassed us, and our natural camouflage surpassed their naked eyes. So, of course, they focused their defensive lines in cold places when we attacked them. All defenders were equipped with technology that could see through our comedian skin, as they put it and armed with cobbled together coal guns based on safety device they developed to fight rampant ignition events. We practically walked over the rest of the planet, taking what we wanted when we wanted and finding little resistance outside of populated areas. It was only a few local sun cycles into our invasion that we first saw their demons, or rather, their demons saw us. They were also creatures that had evolved from the same death world as humans. I honestly don't know how they tamed them, and their savage nature and incredible natural abilities. They were faster and stronger and nearly perfectly adapted to finding us, with near-incredible sense of smell and heightened sense of hearing. So many kinds of demons, from impossibly small, brought about by centuries of selective breeding, to things that were the size that humans could almost ride them into battle. All breeds were bad, but their shepherd and their blood types were the worst. And when those two worked together, we had no chance at all. Several other things we learned to fear was a human saying one of several things to the demon that they were controlling. Seek, track, find, sick em. Most horrifying of all, 
Who's a good boy? Was what we heard on now unmanned communication equipment. They praised their demons. They reward their savagery with facsimiles of human bones, perhaps to placate their demonic natures. A ritual sacrifice to please their need for bone and flesh and blood. Those words were always caught on communication channels before the unit, though sometimes an entire garrison was wiped out, or immediately after, in the case of the praise. I write this as a warning to my people. Humans are formidable by themselves, but their demons are what you should fear. End of story. The algorithm reckons you should be watching this video next, and I recommend that you should be always watching my video. So, click it, click with energy! And yes, clicking that does help the channel. Thank you very much. I would just like to give a quick thanks to the T5 channel members and patrons. Alithia, Parky, Feudicure, Meridian117, Cam Maxwell, Casper Arnholtz, Angry Marine, Lord Azrakal, and White Van 420